Chapter Ten of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy. Chapter Ten. I am racked and cannot cover the monstrous bulk of this ingratitude with any size of words. Shakespeare. The next day they all set out soon after breakfast for a long drive, taking the direction of the camping ground of the lads, where they called and greatly astonished Max with the sight of his father whom he supposed to be far out on the ocean. The boy's delight fully equaled his surprise, and he was inclined to return immediately to Sconset. But the captain advised him to stay a little longer where he was, and he accordingly decided to do so, though regretting the loss of even an hour of the society of the father, who was to him the best man in the world, and the most gallant and capable officer of the navy, in short, the impersonation of all that was good, wise, and brave. The Sconset cottages had been engaged only until the 1st of September, but by that time our friends were so in love with life upon the island that learning of some cottages on the cliffs, a little northwest of Nantucket Town, which were just vacated and for rent, they engaged two of them and at once moved in. From their new abodes they had a fine view of the ocean on that side of the island, and from their porches could watch the swift sailing yachts and other vessels passing to and fro. The bathing ground was reached by a succession of stairways built in the face of the cliff. The surf was fine, and bathing less dangerous there than at Sconset. Those of them who were fond of the sport found it most enjoyable, but the captain took the children into the town almost every day for a lesson in swimming, where the still bathing made it easy for them. And now they took almost daily sails on the harbor, occasionally venturing out into the ocean itself. Pleasant drives also, visiting the old windmill, the old graveyards, soldier's monument and every place of interest in the vicinity besides these there was a little trip to martha's vineyard and several were taken to various points on the adjacent shores of the mainland much as they had enjoyed sconset life it now seemed very pleasant to be again where they could pay frequent visits to libraries and stores go to church and now and then attend a concert or lecture and there was a good deal of quiet pleasure to be found in rambles about the streets and queer byways and lanes of the quaint old town looking at its odd houses and gardens, and perhaps catching a glimpse of the life going on within. They gained an entrance to some. One day it was to the home of an old sea captain, who had given up his former occupation, and now wove baskets of various sizes and shapes, all very neat, strong, and substantial. There was always something pleasant to do. Sometimes it was to take the cars in the little three-mile railroad to Surfside, and pass an hour or two there, again to visit the Athenaeum, and examine its stores of curiosities and treasures, mostly of the sea, or to select a book from its library, or to spend an hour among the old china and antique furniture offered for sale to summer visitors. They were admitted to see the cast of the Dauphin, and bought photographs of it, as well as of many of the scenes in and about the town, with which to refresh their memories of the delightful old place when far away, or to show to friends who had never had the pleasure of a visit to its shores. Violet spent a many enjoyable hour in sketching, finding no lack of subjects worthy of her pencil, and those of the party who liked botany found curious and interesting specimens among the flora of the island. They had very delightful weather most of the time, but there was an occasional rainy day when their employments and amusements must be such as could be found within doors. But even these days, with the aid of fancy work and drawing materials, newspapers, magazines, and books, conversation and games, were very far from dull and wearisome. Often one read aloud while the others listened. One day Elsie brought out a story in manuscript. I have been thinking, she said, that this might interest you all, as being a tale of actual occurrences during the time of the French Revolution. As we have been thinking and talking so much of that, in connection with the story of the poor little Dauphine. What is it, and who is the author? asked her father. It is an historical story written by Betty's sister Molly, she answered. For the benefit of the children, I will make a few preparatory remarks, she added lightly, and with a pleasant smile. While France was torn by those terrible internal convulsions, it was also fighting the combined armies of other nations, particularly Austria and Prussia, who were moved against it from sympathy with the king and a desire to reinstate him on his throne, and a sense of danger to themselves if the disorganizing principles of the revolutionists should spread into their territories. Piedmont was involved in this conflict, Perhaps you remember that it is separated from Dauphine in France by the Coutien Alps, and that among the valleys on the Piedmontese side dwell the Waldenses, 
of Vaudois evangelical Christians, who were for 1,200 years persecuted by the Church of Rome, though their own sovereigns often joined in these persecutions, and the laws of the land were always far more oppressive to them than to their popish fellow citizens. The Waldenses were ever loyal to king and country, and were sure to be called upon for their defense in time of war. In the spring of 1793, some three months after the beheading of King Louis the Sixteenth, and while the poor queen, the dauphin, and the princesses, his sister and aunt, still languished in their dreadful prisons, a French army was attempting to enter Piedmont from Dauphiny, which they could do only through the mountain passes, and these all the able-bodied Waldenses and some Swiss troops, under the command of General Godin, a Swiss officer, were engaged in defending. It is among the homes of the Waldenses, thus left defenseless against any plot their popish neighbors might hatch for their destruction, that the scene of this story is laid. Now, Papa, will you be so kind as to read it aloud, she concluded, handing it to him. With pleasure, he said, and all having gathered around to listen, he began. On a lovely morning in the middle of May, 1793, a young girl and a little lad might have been seen climbing the side of a mountain, overlooking the beautiful valley of Lucerna. They were Lucia and Henri Vittoria, children of a brave Valdensian soldier, then serving in the army of his king, against the French, with whom their country was at war. Lucia had a sweet, innocent face, lighted up by a pair of large, soft, dark eyes, and was altogether very fair to look upon. Her lithe, slender figure bounded from rock to rock, with movements as graceful and almost as swift as those of a young gazelle. Sister, cried the lad, half pantingly, how nimble and fleet of foot you are today. I can scarce keep pace with you. Ah, Henri, it is because my heart is so light and glad, she returned with a silvery laugh, pausing for an instant that he might overtake her. Yes, he said as he gained her side, the good news from my father and Pierre and Rudolf Goneto, that they are well and yet unharmed by French sword or bullet, has filled all our hearts with joy. Is it not to carry these glad tidings to Rudolf's mother? We take this early walk? Yes, the most pleasant errand, Henri, and the rose deepened on the maiden's cheek, already glowing with health and exercise. They were now far above the valley, and another moment brought them to their destination, a broad ledge of rock on which stood a cottage, with its grove of chestnut trees and a little patch of carefully cultivated ground. Magdalene Gorneto, the mother of Rudolf, a matron of placid countenance, and sweet and gentle dignity of mien, had seen their approach and come forth to meet them. She embraced Lucia with grave tenderness, bestowed a kind caress upon Henri, and leading the way to her neat dwelling, seated them and herself upon its porch, from which there was a magnificent view of the whole extent of the valley. To the left, and close at hand, lay San Giovanni, with its pretty villages, smiling vineyards, cornfields, and verdant meadows, sloping gently away to the waters of the Pelice. On the opposite side of the river, situated upon a slight eminence, with the Roman Catholic town of Lucerna, to the right, almost at their feet, embowered amid beautiful trees, chestnut, walnut, and mulberry, La Tour, the Waldensian capital, and home of Lucia and Henri, nestled among its vineyards and orchards. Farther up the vale might be seen Bobby Villar, and many smaller villages, scattered amid the fields and vineyards, or hanging on the slopes of the hills, while hamlets and single cottages clung here and there to the rugged mountainside. Wherever a terrace, a little basin or hollow afforded a spot susceptible of cultivation. Beyond all towered the Cochian Alps that formed the barrier between Piedmont and Dauphine, their snowy pinnacles glittering in the rays of the newly risen sun. It was thither the able-bodied men of the valley had gone to defend the passes against the French. Toward those lofty mountains, Lucia's soft eyes turned with wistful, questioning gaze for they were father, brother, lover, hourly exposed to all the dangers of war. Magdalene noticed the look, and softly murmured, God, even the God of our fathers cover their heads in the day of battle. He will, I know he will, said Lucia, turning to her friend with a bright, sweet smile. You bring me tidings, my child, said Magdalene, taking the maiden's hand in her. Good tidings, for your face is full of gladness. Yes, dear friend, your son is well. Lucia answered with a modest, ingenuous blush. My father also and Pierre, we had word from them only yesternight. But ah me, she added with a sigh, what fearful scenes of blood and carnage are yet enacted in Paris, the gay French capital, for from thence also the courier brought news. Blood, he says, flows like water, and not content with having taken the life of their king, they forced the queen and the rest of the royal family 
to languish in prison and the guillotine is constantly at work dispatching its wretched victims whose only crime in many instances is that of wealth and noble birth alas poor wretches alas poor king and queen cried magdalene and for ourselves what danger should such bloodthirsty ruffians force an entrance into our valleys the pass's head needs be well guarded lucia lingered not long with her friend for whom duties claimed her attention magdalene went with them to the brow of the hill and again embracing lucia said in tender joyous accents though you must now bid adieu my child when the war is over you will come to brighton rudolph's home and mine with your constant presence yes such is the pledge he won for me ere we parted the maiden answered with a modest sincerity tender smile hovering about the full red lips and a vivid color suffusing for an instant the delicately rounded cheek then with an affectionate good-bye she tripped away down the rocky path henri following a glad flush still lingered on the sweet girlish face a dewy light shone in the soft eyes her thoughts were full of magdalene's parting words and the picture they had called up of the happy married life awaiting rudolph and herself when he should return to the pursuits of peace and he at his post in those more distant mountains thought of her and his mother safe as he fondly trusted in the homes his strong arm was helping to defend against a foreign foe the vaudois judging others by themselves were notwithstanding their many past experiences with the treacherous cruelty of rome strangely unsuspicious of their popish neighbors the descent was scarcely yet accomplished by our young friends when startled by the sound of heavy footsteps and gruff voices in their rear and casting a look behind them they beheld rapidly approaching by another path which wound about the base of the mountain two men of most ruffianly aspect a wild terror seized upon the maiden as for an instant she caught the gaze of mingled malice and sensuality they bent upon her and seizing henri's hand she flew over the ground toward la tour with the fleetness of a hunted doe for herself what she had not to fear and for the child that he might be slain or reserved for fate esteemed by the vaudois worse than death in being carried off to pigernal and brought up in idolatrous faith the men pursued calling to her with oaths curses obscene words and jeering laughter these but quickened her flight she gained the bridge over agromna sped across it over the intervening ground and through the gate into the town the footsteps of her pursuers echoing close behind aha escaped my embraces for the present have you my pretty barbette quoth one of the miscreants following her with gloating cruel eyes as she sped onward up the street feeling only comparatively safe even there ah well it but delays my pleasure a few hours i know where to find ye and shall pay my respects to-night and i added his companion with a fierce laugh to ye and many another like ye it's work quite to my taste holy mother church is laid out for us to-night andre yes yes giuseppe we'll not quarrel out with the work or the wages all the plunder we can lay hands on to say naught of the pretty maids such as yon or the escape from the fires of purgatory they were wending their way to the convent of the recollets as they talked arriving at its gates they were immediately admitted to find it filled with cutthroats such as themselves and soon learned that the church also and the house of the cure were in like condition good they cried how many names in all seven hundred said one eight hundred asserted another well well be it which it may we're strong enough for the work all the able-bodied barbetti being on the frontier cried andre exultantly will make short shrift with the old men women and children yes long live the holy roman church hurrah for the holy faith down with the barbetti cried a chorus of voices we'll have a second saint bartholomew in these valleys and rid them of the hated presence of the cursed heretics that we will responded giuseppe but what's the order of the proceedings all the faithful to meet at lucerna at sunset the vesper bell of the convent gives a signal shortly after and we immediately spread ourselves over the valley on a heretic hunt that from san giovanni to bobby shall leave not a soul alive to tell the tale while magdalene and lucia conversed in the cottage of the former m brianza cure of lucerna seated in the confessional listened with horror and indignation to a tale of intended wholesale rapine murder and arson which his penitent was unfolding i will have neither part nor lot in this thing said the priest to himself as he left the church a moment later nay more i shall warn the intended victims of their danger hurrying to his house he instantly dispatched messengers in all haste to san giovanni and la tour about the same time in the more remote town of cavour the fiendish plot was revealed to captain odetti 
an officer of the Piedmontese militia, then enrolled to act against the French, with the request that he would take part in its execution. Being a rigid Romanist, it was confidently expected that he would willingly do so. But as noble and humane a man as was said as a good curé, he listened with like horror and detestation, and mounting his horse instantly set off for Latour to warn the helpless folk of the threatening calamity, and assist in averting it, if that might yet be possible. He travelled post-haste, for time pressed, the appointed hour for the attack already drew so near that it was doubtful if even the most prompt action could still avail. Pale and breathless with haste and terror, Lucia and Henri gained the shelter of their home in reply to the anxious questioning of mother and grandparents, told of the hot pursuit of the evil men who had chased them into the town. Their story was heard with much concern, not only by the family, but also by a young man who had entered nearly at the same moment with themselves. His right arm was in a sling, his face, thin and wan with suffering, wore an expression of anxiety and alarm, which deepened momentarily as the narrative proceeded. How is Bianca? he asked. Upon its conclusion, the quiet tone telling nothing of the profound solicitude that filled his breast. Much the same, returned Sarah Vittoria, the mother. A little better, I think, said a weak but cheerful voice from the next room. Maurice, how is your poor arm? Come and tell me. He rose and complied with the request. Bianca, the elder sister of Lucia, had been for a year or more the betrothed of Maurice Labore. He found her lying pale and languid upon a couch. "'What is it, Maurice?' she asked presently, noticing his troubled look. "'I wish you were well, Bianca.' "'Ah, I am more concerned about your wound.' His thoughts seemed far away. He rose hastily. "'I must speak to your grandsire. I will be in again,' and he left the room. Marc Roussel, the father of Sarah Vittoria, a venerable white-haired veteran, who had seen his fourscore years and ten, sat at the open door of the cottage, leaning upon his staff, his eyes fixed thoughtfully upon the towering heights of Mount Van Dillen. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever, Maurice heard him murmur as he drew near. There was comfort in the words, and the cloud of care partially lifted from the brow of the young Valdras, but accosting the aged saint with deep respect, and bending down to speak to close to his ear, he uttered a few rapid sentences, in an undertone. There seemed a threatening of danger, Father Roselle. Evil-looking men, such as Lucia and the lad, were but now describing, have been seen coming into the town for the last two or three days. Till now, it is said, the Romish church, the convent of Recollects, the house of the curé, and several other Catholic houses are full of them. What errand thinks you draws them hither, just at this time, when nearly every able-bodied Vaudois is absent in the frontier? Roselle's face reflected somewhat of the agitation and alarm in that of Maurice, but ere he could open his lips to reply, a neighbor, a young woman with a child in her arms, came rushing across the street and calling to them in tones tremulous with excitement and affright, told of the warning just brought by Brianza's messenger. Her face was white with terror, and she clasped her infant to her breast with a look of agony as she asked, Can it be, oh, can it be, that we are all to be slain in our helplessness? Something must be done in that quickly. But what, alas, can we do? Our husbands, brothers, fathers are all at a distance, and the fatal hour draws near. The tones of her voice and some of her words had reached the ears of those within the cottage, and they now gathered about her in an intensely excited, terrified group. Question and answer followed in rapid succession, till each knew all that she had heard. Can it be possible, cried Sarah, can even popish cruelty, ingratitude and treachery go so far? Are not our brave defenders theirs also, keeping the passes against a common foe? A mournful shake of the head from her aged father was the only reply, save the sobs and cries of the frightened children. But at that instant a horseman came dashing up the street, suddenly drew rein before the dwelling, and hastily dismounting, hurried toward them. Captain Odetti, exclaimed Roselle in some surprise. Yes, Roselle, I come to warn you, though alas, I fear I am too late to prevent bloodshed, said the officer sending a pitying glance from one to another of the terror-stricken group. There is a conspiracy against you. The assassins are even now on foot, but if I cannot save you, I will perish with you. The honor of my religion is at stake, and I must justify it by sharing your danger. Can it be that such designs are really entertained against us? asked Roselle, in trembling tones, glancing from one loved face to another, with a look of keenest anguish. On what a pretext? I know of none the late base and cowardly surrender of Fort Mirabeau. There was but one Vaudois present, and his voice was raised against it. True, but what matters that to foes 
bent upon your destruction. Someone was to blame, and why not make a scapegoat of the hated Vaudois? But let us not waste time in useless discussion. We must act. The fearful tidings flew from house to house, and in the wildest terror the feeble folk began to make what preparations they could for self-defense. By Odetti's advice, barricading the streets and houses, collecting missiles to hurl down from the upper windows upon the heads of the assassins, and at the same time dispatching messenger after messenger to General Godin, the Swiss officer in command of the troops on the frontier, telling of the danger and praying for instant aid. But he, alas, unable in the nobility of his soul to credit the existence of a plot so atrocious, turned a deaf ear to their entreaties, declaring his conviction that the alarm was groundless, a mere panic, and that his troops could not be spared to go on so useless an errand. As one courier after another returned with his same disheartening report, the terror and despair were such as to beggar description. Lucia Vittoria, recalling with many a shudder of wild affright the evil looks and fierce words of justice of her pursuers of the morning, resolved to defend her own, her mother's, and sister's honor to the last gasp. The terrible excitement of the hour seemed to give her unnatural strength, for a task of lifting and carrying stones and fragments of rock to be used in repelling the expected assault. Assisted by Henri and every member of the family, capable of the exertion, she toiled unceasingly while anything yet remained to be done. In the midst of their exertions, Magdalene Gourne suddenly appeared among them. I have heard, and I have come to live or die with you, dear friends, she said, and fell to work with the others. At length all was completed, and they could only await in dreadful suspense the coming of events. They had continued to importune the commandant, but with no better success than at first. In the closed and barricaded dwellings, hearts were going up to God in agonized prayer for help, for deliverance. In that of the Vittorias, few words were spoken, save as now and again the voice of the aged Roselle, or that of his venerable wife, his daughter, or Magdalene Goneta, broke the awful silence with some promise from the book of books to those who trust in the Lord. Maurice, whose father and brothers were away with the army, torn with anxiety for mother, sisters, and betrothed alike, persuaded the former to follow Magdalene's example in repairing to the house of the Vittorias, that such efforts as he was able to put forth in his crippled condition might be made in their common defense. Freely would he shed the last drop of his blood to shield them from harm. But alas, what match was he for even one of the horde of desperados that would soon be upon them? What could he do? How speedily would he be overpowered? Help must be obtained. He stole out through the garden to learn the latest news from the frontier. The fourteenth courier had just returned in sadness. The commandant was still incredulous, still firm in his refusal to render aid. You are then given up to the sword of the assassin, groaned his hearers. No, no, never, it must not be, cried Maurice with sudden stern determination, though there was a quiver of pain in his voice, and sending a glance of mingled love and anguish toward the cottage that sheltered those dearer to him than life, he set off at a brisk pace up the valley. Love moved him to the task, and, spite of weakness and pain, never before had he trodden the steep and dangerous mountain paths with such celerity. Arrived and admitted to Godin's presence, he poured out his petition with the vehemence of one who can take no denial, urging his suit with all the eloquence of intense anxiety and deep conviction of the terrible extremity of the feeble folk in the valley. Doubt began to creep into the mind of the brave officer. Might there not be some truth in the story after all? Yet he answered it as before. A mere panic! I cannot believe in a plot so atrocious! What? Murder in cold blood the innocent, helpless wives and children of the brave men who are defending theirs from a common foe? No, no, human nature is not so depraved. So it was thought on the eve of the Sicilian Vespers, on the eve of St. Bartholomew, at the time when Castrocaro, when De la Trinite, when Pianzeza. Ah, interrupted the, the general with a frown, but those were deeds of days long gone by, and men are not now what they then were. Sir, returned Maurice earnestly, for twelve hundred years the she-wolf of Rome has ravaged her fold, slaying sheep and lambs alike sparing neither age nor sex, and, sir, it is her boast that she never changes. Nor are men incapable of the grossest injustice and cruelty even in these days. Look at the fearful scenes of blood enacted even now in France. General, the lives of thousands of his majesty's evangelical subjects are trembling in the balance, and I do most solemnly assure you that unless saved by your speedy interposition or a direct miracle from heaven, they will this night fall victims to sanguinary plot. 
Ah, sir, what more can I say to convince, to move you? The assassins are already assembling. The time wanes fast. And will you stretch forth no hand to save their innocent, helpless victim? The general was evidently moved by the appeal. Had I but sufficient proof, he muttered, in an undertone of doubt and perplexity. Maurice caught eagerly at the word. Proof, general! Would Odetti, would Brianza have warned us? Were the danger not imminent? And do not the annals of your own Switzerland furnish examples of similar plots? True, too true, yet... But at this moment the sixteenth courier came panting up to pour out, in an agony of haste and fear, the same tale of contemplated wholesale massacre, and the story reaching the ears of the Vaudois troops, they gathered about the general, imploring, demanding to be sent instantly to the aid of their menaced wives and children. General Godin's mind had been filled with conflicting emotions. While Maurice spoke, his humanity, his honor as a soldier, his duty to the government were struggling for the mastery. Ought he to march without orders, or even the knowledge of his superiors? and that, too, with no more certain proof of the illegal assembling of those who were said to be plotting against the peace and safety of the Vaudois families. Yet there was no time to reconnoitre ere the dire mischief might be done. His humanity at last prevailed over more prudential considerations. He commanded the brigade of Valdenses to march instantly, and himself followed with another division. Bianca Vittoria had been gathered to an upper room, where all the family were now gathered about her bed. With unutterable anguish, the mother looked upon her two lovely daughters in the early bloom of womanhood, the babe sleeping upon her breast, the little ones clinging to her skirts, her aged and infirm parents all apparently doomed to a speedy, violent death, and worse than death, her own danger was well nigh forgotten in theirs. Utter silence reigned in that room, and the adjoining one, at this time occupied by Magdalene and the mother and sisters of Maurice. Every ear was strained to catch the sound of the approaching footsteps of the assassins, or the longed-for deliverers, a very short season, would now decide their fate. Oh, would help never come! Lucia, kneeling beside her sister's couch, clasping one thin white hand in hers, suddenly dropped it and sprang to her feet. How fast it grows dark! And what was that? As a heavy rolling sound reverberated among the mountains. Artillery! And her tones grew wild with terror. Thunder! The heavens are black with clouds, said Magdalene, coming in and speaking with the calmness of despair. A heavy clap nearly drowned her words. Then followed crash and crash. The rain came down in torrents. The wind, which had suddenly risen to almost a hurricane, dashing it with fury against walls and windows. The darkness became intense, except as ever and anon the lurid glare of the lightning lit up the scene for an instant, giving to each a momentary glimpse of the pale, terror-stricken faces of the others. Alas, alas, no help can reach us now, moaned Sarah, clasping her babe closer to her breast. No troops can march over our fearful mountain passes in this terrific storm and thick darkness. We must die. O oh God of our fathers, save us. Let us not fall into the hands of those ruffians who, more to be feared than the wild beasts of the forest, would rob us of honor and of life, cried Lucia, falling upon her knees again and lifting hands and eyes to heaven. Amen, responded the trembling voice of Roselle. Lord, thine hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither thine ear heavy that it cannot hear. The scenes that followed what pen may portray, the wild anguish of some expressed in incoherent words, shrieks of terror and cries for help. They seemed to hear amid the roar of the elements the hurried footsteps of the assassins, and to see in the lightning's flash the glitter of their steel, and the mute agony of others, as in the calmness of despair, they crouched helplessly together awaiting the coming blow. Meanwhile, the fathers, husbands, sons, brothers were hastening homeward, their brave hearts torn with anguish, at the thought of the impossibility of arriving before the hour set for the murderers to begin their fiendish work. There was no regular order of march, but each rushed onward at his utmost speed, praying aloud to God for help to increase it, and calling frantically to his fellows to hasten, hasten to the rescue of all they held most dear. Alas for their hopes, the shades of evening were already falling, and the storm presently came on in terrific violence. The darkness, the blinding momentary glare of the lightning, the crashing thunder peals, the driving, pouring rain and fierce wind, greatly increasing the difficulties and perils of the advance. God himself seemed to be against them. But urged on by fear and love for their helpless ones, and by parties of distracted women and children, sent forward from Latour, some of whom, in their terror and despair, asserted that the work of blood had already begun. And they pressed onward without a moment's pause, springing from rock to rock, sliding down precipices, scaling giddy heights, leaping chasms, which at another time they would have not dared to attempt 
and tearing through the rushing, roaring mountain torrents already greatly swollen by the rain. They reached the last of these, and dashing through it were presently in sight of La Tour, when the tolling of the vesper bell of the convent of the Recollets, the preconcerted signal for the assassins to sally forth, smote upon their ears. "'Too late! Too late!' cried Rudolf Gorneto, hoarsely. "'But if too late to save, we will revenge!' Uh, responded a chorus of deep voices, as with frantic haste they sped over the intervening space. The next moment the tramp of their feet and the clang of their arms were heard in the streets of the town. Windows and doors flew open, and with cries and tears of joy and thankfulness, wives, children, and aged parents gathered about them, almost smothering them with caresses. The storm, which had seemed to seal their doom, had proved their salvation, preventing some of the murderers from reaching the rendezvous in season, and so terrifying the others that they dared not attempt the deed alone, especially as it had begun to be rumored that troops were on the march to the threatened valley. Rudolph found himself encircled by his mother's arms, her kisses and tears warm upon his cheek. He held her clothed, both hearts too full for speech. Then a single word fell from the soldier's lips. Lucia, safe. Darting into the house, guided by some subtle instinct, he stood the next moment in the upper room, where she knelt by her sister's couch, the two mingling their tears with thanksgivings together. All was darkness, but at the sound of the well-known step, Lucia sprang up with a cry of joy. Saved! Rudolph's emotions, as he held her to his heart, were too big for utterance. Someone entered with a light. It was Magdalene, and behind her came Maurice, pale, haggard, and dripping with rain. Bianca's heart gave a joyous bound. He, too, was safe. But a tumult of voices from below, some stern, angry, threatening, others sullen, dogged, defiant, or craven with abject terror, attracted their attention. Magdalene set down the light and hurried away in the direction of the sounds, Rudolph and Lucia following. A number of the Waldenses, sword in hand and eyes flashing with righteous indignation, were gathered about two of the would-be assassins, caught by them almost on the threshold of the cottage. Their errand, who could doubt, and Henri had recognized them as his and Lucia's pursuers of the morning. She, too, knew them instantly and clung pale with affright to Rudolph's arm, while he could scarce restrain himself from rushing upon and running them through with his sword. Spare us, sirs, entreated Andre, quaking with fear under the wrathful glance of the father of the maidens. Spare us, we have not harmed you or yours, nor plotted their destruction. Miserable wretch, ask not your life upon the plea that it is not forfeit. Can I doubt what would have been the fate of my wife and daughters had they fallen into your hands? But your religion teaches you to forgive. True, yet also to protect the helpless ones, committed to my care. We will leave your valleys this hour, never to set foot in them again. Ah, yet how far we, may we trust the word of one whose creed bids him keep no faith with heretics? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. It was the voice of the aged Roselle which broke the momentary silence. Vittoria sheathed his sword, not his to usurp the prerogative of him who had that night given so signal deliverance to his Israel of the Alps. Is that all? asked Lulu drawing a long breath as Mr. Dinsmore refolded the manuscript and gave it back to his daughter. Yes, he said. The author is told of the deliverance of the imperiled ones, and that Vittoria refrained from taking vengeance upon their cowardly foes, and so ends the story of that night of terror in the valleys. But were all the Waldenses equally forbearing, Grandpa? asked Zoe. They were. In all the valleys not a drop of blood was shed. Justly exasperated, though the Waldenses were, they contented themselves with sending to the government a list of the names of the baffled conspirators. But no notice was taken of it. The would-be murderers were never called to account, till they appeared before a greater than an earthly tribunal. But General Godin was presently superseded in his command, and shortly after dismissed the service. Two plain indications that the sympathy of the government was with the assassins, and not at all with their intended victims. But is it true, sir? asked Max. Yes, it is true that at that time in those valleys, and under those circumstances, such a plot was hatched, and its carrying out prevented, in the exact way that this story relates. Mean, cowardly, wicked fellows they must have been, to want to murder the wives and children, and burn and plunder the houses of the men that were defending them and theirs from a common enemy, exclaimed the boy, his face flushing and eyes flashing with righteous indignation. Very true, but such are the lessons Popery teaches, and always has taught, no faith with heretics. No mercy to any who deny her dogmas, and that anything is right and commendable, which is done to destroy those who do not acknowledge her authority, and to increase her power 
one of her doctrines being that the end sanctifies the means. But what did they mean when they said they were going to have a second St. Bartholomew in the Valleys? asked Grace. Did you never hear of the massacre of St. Bartholomew, daughter? her father asked, stroking her hair caressingly as she sat upon his knee. No, Papa, won't you tell me about it? It occurred in France a little more than three hundred years ago. It was a dreadful massacre of the Protestants to the number of from sixty to a hundred thousand, and it was begun on the night of the twenty third of August which the papists call St. Bartholomew's Day. The Protestants were shot, stabbed, murdered in various ways in their beds, in the street anywhere that they could be found, and for no crime but being Protestants. And Popery would do the very same now and here, had she the power, commented Mr. Dinsmore. For it is her proudest boast that she never changes. She teaches her own infallibility, and what she has done she will do again if she can. What is infallibility, Papa? asked Grace. To be infallible is to be incapable of error or of making mistakes, he answered. So Pope teaching that she has never done wrong or made a mistake justifies all the horrible cruelty she practiced in former times. And, in fact, she occasionally tells us, through some of her bolder or less wary followers, that what she has done she will do again as soon as she attains the power. Which she never will in this free land, exclaimed Edward. Never, provided Columbia's sons are faithful to their trust, remembering that Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, responded his grandfather. Grace was clinging tightly to her father, and her little face was pale and wore a look of fright. What is it, darling? he asked. Oh, Papa, will they come here sometime and kill us? she asked tremulously. Do not be frightened, my dear little one, he said, holding her close. You are in no danger from them. I don't believe all Roman Catholics would have Protestants persecuted if they could, remarked Betty. Do you, uncle? No. I think there are some truly Christian people among them, he answered, some who have not yet heard and heeded the call, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. We were talking, not of papists, but of popery. Sincere hatred of the system is not incompatible with sincere love to its deluded followers. End of chapter 10 Recording by Amy Chapter 11 of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy. Chapter 11. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. Psalm 5 3. It was early morning. Captain Raymond was pacing to and fro along the tops of the cliffs, now sending a glance seaward, and now toward the door of the cottage, which was his temporary home as if expecting a companion in his ramble. Presently, the door opened, and Lulu stepped out upon the porch. One eager look showed her father, and she bounded with joyful step to meet him. "'Good morning, my dear papa,' she cried, holding up her face for a kiss, which he gave with hearty affection. "'Good morning, my dear little early bird,' he responded. "'Come, I will help you down the steps, and we will pace the sands at the water's edge.' This was Lulu's time for having her father to herself, as she phrased it. He was sure to be out at this early hour, if the weather would permit, and she almost equally sure to join him, and as the others liked to lie a little longer in bed, there was seldom any one to share his society with her. He led her down the long flights of stairs and across the level expanse of sand, close to where the booming waves dashed up their spray. For some moments the two stood hand in hand, silently gazing upon sea and sky, bright with the morning sunlight. Then they turned and paced the beach for a time, and then the captain led his little girl to a seat in the porch of a bathing house, from which they could still look far out over the sea. Papa, she said, nestling close to his side, I am very fond of being down here all alone with you. Are you, daughter? he said, bending down to caress her hair and cheek. Well, I dearly love to have my little girl by my side. How long have you been up? I can't tell exactly, because you know, Papa, there is no timepiece in my room. But I wasn't long dressing, for I didn't want to lose a minute of the time I might have out here with you. Did you do nothing but put on your clothes after leaving your bed? He asked gravely. I washed my hands and face and smoothed my hair. And was that all? She glanced up at him in surprise at the deep gravity of his tone, then suddenly comprehending what his questioning meant, hung her head while her cheek flushed hotly. Yes, Papa, she replied in a low, abashed tone. I am very, very sorry to hear it, he said. If my little girl begins the day without a prayer to God for help to do right, 
without thanking him for his kind care over her while she slept. She can hardly expect to escape sins and sorrows, which will make it anything but a happy day. Papa, I do most always say my prayers in the morning and at night, but I didn't feel like doing it this time. Do you think people ought to pray when they don't feel like it? Yes, I think that is the very time when they most need to pray. They need to ask God to take away the hardness of their hearts, the evil in them that is hiding his love in their own needs, so that they have no gratitude to express for all his great goodness and mercy to them, no petitions to offer up for strength to resist temptation and to walk steadily in his ways, no desire to confess their sins and plead for pardon for Jesus' sake. Ah, that is certainly the time when we have most urgent need to pray. Jesus taught that men, and in the Bible men stand for the whole human race, ought always to pray and not to faint, and we are commanded to pray without ceasing. Papa, how can we do that? she asked. You know we have to be doing other things sometimes. It does not mean that we are to be always on our knees, he said, but that we are to live so near to God, so loving him and so feeling our constant dependence upon him, that our hearts will be very often going up to his throne in silent petition, praise, or confession. And if we live in such union with him, we will highly prize the privilege of drawing especially near to him at certain seasons. We will be glad to be alone with him often and will not forget or neglect to retire to our closets night and morning for a little season of close communion with our best and dearest friend. You say you love to be alone with me, your earthly father. I trust the time will come when you will love far better to be alone with your heavenly father. I must often be far away from you, but he is ever near. I may be powerless to help you, though close at your side, but he is almighty to save, to provide for, and to defend and he never turns a deaf ear to the cry of his children. Yes, Papa, but oh, I wish that you were always near me too, she said, leaning her cheek affectionately against his arm. I am very, very sorry that I ever have been a trouble to you and spoiled your enjoyment of your visits home. I know you are, daughter, but you have been very good of late. I have rejoiced to see that you were really trying to rule your own spirit. So far as I know, you have been entirely and cheerfully obedient to me, and have not indulged in a single fit of passion or sullenness. Yes, Papa, but I have been nearly in a passion two or three times, but you gave me a look just in time to help me to resist it. But when you are gone, I shall not have that help. Then, my child, you must remember that your Heavenly Father is looking at you, that he bids you fight against the evil of your nature, and if you seek it of him, will give you strength to overcome. Here is a text for you. I want you to remember it constantly, and to that end, repeat it often to yourself. Thou, God, seest me. And do not forget that he sees not only the outward conduct, but the inmost thoughts and feelings of the heart. A boy's glad shout and merry whistle mingled pleasantly with the sound of the dashing of the waves, and Max came bounding over the sands toward their sheltered nook. "'Good morning, Papa,' he cried. "'You too, Lulu. Ahead of me as usual, I see.' "'Yes,' the captain said, reaching out a hand to grasp the lead and gazing with fatherly affection and pride into the handsome young face glowing with health and happiness." She is the earliest young bird in the family nest. However, she seeks her roost earlier than her brother does his. Yes, and I am not so very late, am I, sir? No, my boy, I do not suppose you have taken any more sleep than you need for your health and growth, and I certainly would not have you do with less. I know you wouldn't, Papa. Such a good, kind father as you are, responded Max. I wouldn't swap fathers with any other boy, he added, with a look of mingled fun and affection. "'Nor would I exchange my son for any other. "'Not even a better one,' returned the captain laughingly, "'tightening his clasp of the sturdy brown hand he held. "'I haven't heard yet the story of yesterday's success in boating and fishing. "'Come sit down here by my side and let me have it.' "'Max obeyed, nothing loath, for he was becoming quite expert in both, "'and always found in his father an interested listener to the story of his exploits. "'He and the other lads had returned from their camping.' at the time of the removal of the family party from Sconset to Nantucket Town. On the conclusion of his narrative, the captain pronounced it breakfast time, and they returned to the house. After breakfast, as nearly the whole party were gathered upon the porch, discussing the question what should be the amusements of the day, a near neighbor with whom they had some acquaintance ran in to ask if they would join a company who were going over to Shimo to have a clam bake. "'The name of the place is new to me,' remarked Mr. Dinsmore. "'Is it a town, Mrs. Atwood?' "'Oh, no,' replied the lady. "'There is only one dwelling, a farmhouse, with its barns and other outhouses, comprises the whole place. 
It is on the shore of the harbor, some miles beyond Nantucket Town. It is a pleasant spot, and I think we shall all have an enjoyable time, particularly if I can persuade you all to go. A regular New England clam bake, said Elsie. I should really like to attend one, and I'm much obliged for your invitation, Mrs. Atwood, as we all are, I am sure. No one felt disposed to decline the invitation, and it was soon settled that all would go. The clam bake was to occupy only the afternoon, so they would have time to make all necessary arrangements, and for the customary surf and still bath. Mrs. Atwood had risen to take leave. Ah, she said, I was near forgetting something I meant to say. We never dress for these expeditions, but on the contrary, wear the oldest and shabbiest dresses we have, considering them altogether the most suitable to the occasion, as then we need not be troubled if they would be wet with spray or soiled by contact with seaweed grass or anything else. A very sensible custom, Mrs. Dinsmore responded, and one which we shall all probably follow. Mrs. Atwood had hardly reached the gate when Lulu, turning to her father with a very discontented face, exclaimed, "'I don't want to wear a shabby old dress. Must I, Papa?' "'You will wear whatever your Grandma Elsie or Mama directs,' he answered, giving her a warning look. Then, motioning her to come close to his side, he whispered in her ear, "'I see that you are inclined to be ill-tempered and rebellious again, as I feared you would when I learned that you had begun the day without a prayer for help to do and feel right.' Go now to your room and ask it. You needn't fret, Lou. You don't own a dress that any little girl ought to feel ashamed to wear, remarked Betty, as the child turned to obey. And we are all going to wear the very worst we have here with us, I presume, added Zoe. At least such is my intention. Provided your husband approves, whispered Edward sportively. Anyhow, she answered, drawing herself up in pretended offense, can't a woman do as she pleases, even in such trifles? Ah! but it is the privileges of a child-wife which are under discussion now. Now, sir, after that, you shall just have the trouble of telling me what to wear, said Zoe, rising from the couch where they had been sitting side by side. Come along and choose. Lulu was in the room where she slept, obeying her father's order so far as outward actions went, but there was little more than lip service in the prayer she offered, for her thoughts were wandering upon the subject of dress and ways and means for obtaining permission to wear what she wished that afternoon. By the time she had finished saying her prayers, she had also reached a conclusion as to her best plan for securing the desired privilege. Grandma Elsie was so very kind and gentle that there seemed more hope of moving her than anyone else. So to her she went, and, delighted to find her comparatively alone, no one being near enough to overhear a low-toned conversation, began at once. Grandma Elsie, I want to wear a white dress to the clam bake and I think it would be suitable, because the weather is very warm, and white will wash, so that it would not matter if I did get it soiled. My dear child, it is your father's place to decide what concerns his children when he is with them, Elsie said, drawing the little girl to her, and smoothing her hair with soft, caressing touch. Yes, ma'am, but he says you and Mamma Vi are to decide this, so if you will only say I may wear the white dress, he will let me, won't you, please? If your father is satisfied with your choice, I shall certainly raise no objection. Nor will your mamma, I am sure. Oh, thank you, ma'am, and Lulu ran off gleefully in search of her father. She found him on the veranda, busied with the morning paper, and to her satisfaction, he too was alone. What is it, daughter? he asked, glancing from his paper to her eager, animated face. About what I'm to wear this afternoon, papa. I would like to wear the white dress I had on yesterday evening, and Grandma Elsie does not object, and she says she knows Mamma Vi will not, if you say I may. "'Did she say she thought it a suitable dress?' he asked gravely. Lulu hung her head. "'No, sir. She didn't say that she did or she didn't. "'Go and ask her the question.' Lulu went back and asked it. "'No, my child, I do not,' Elsie answered. "'It is very unlikely that anyone else will be in white or anything at all dressy, "'and you will look overdressed, which is in very bad taste. "'Besides, though the weather seems warm enough for such thin material here on shore, it will be a great deal cooler in the water, and should the waves of spray come dashing over us, you would find your dress clinging to you like a wet rag, neither beauty nor comfort in it. I could wear a waterproof over it while we are sailing, said Lulu. Even that might not prove a perfect protection, Elsie replied. I think, my dear, you will do well to content yourself to wear your traveling dress, which is of a light woolen material, neat without being too dressy, and of a color that will not show every little soil. "'and it is as good and handsome as the dress I shall wear, 
or as rosy, and probably as anybody else will have on. But you can choose for yourself, Grandma Elsie, and I wish I could. That is one of the privileges of older years, Elsie answered pleasantly. I was considerably older than you are before I was allowed to select my own attire. But I repeat that I shall not raise the slightest objection to your wearing anything your father is willing to see on you. Lulu's hopes were almost gone, but she would make one more effort. She went to her father, and, putting her arms round his neck, begged in her most coaxing tones for the gratification of her wish. "'What did your Grandma Elsie say?' he asked. Lulu faithfully, though with no little reluctance, repeated every word Elsie had said to her on the subject. "'I entirely agree with her,' said the captain. "'So entirely that even had she found no objection to urge against it, I should have forbidden you to wear the dress.' Lulu heard him with a clouded brow. In fact, the expression of her face was decidedly sullen. Her father observed it with sorrow and concern. "'Sit down here till I am ready to talk to you,' he said, indicating a chair close at his side. Lulu obeyed, sitting quietly there while he finished his paper. Throwing it aside at length, he took her hand and drew her in between his knees, putting an arm about her waist. "'My little daughter,' he said in his usual kind tone, I am afraid you care too much for dress and finery. What I desire for you is that you may be clothed with humility and have the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is, in the sight of God, of great price. I never can have that, Papa, for it isn't a bit like me, she said, with a sort of despairing impatience and disgust at herself. No, that is too true. It is not like you as you are by nature, the evil nature inherited from me. But God is able to change that, to give you a clean heart and renew within you a right spirit. Jesus is a savior from sin. He saves none in their sins, and he is able to save to the uttermost, able to take away to the very last remains of the old corrupt nature with which we were born. Oh, my child, seek his help to fight against it and to overcome. It grieves me more than I can express to see you again showing an unlovely, willful temper. Oh, Papa, don't be grieved, she said, throwing her arms round his neck and pressing her lips to his cheek. I will be good and wear whatever I'm told. Look pleasant about it, too, for indeed I do love you too well to want to grieve you and spoil your pleasure. Ah, that is my own dear little girl, he answered, returning her caresses. The sullen expression had vanished from her face, and it wore its brightest look, yet it clouded again the next moment, but with sorrow, not anger. As she sighed, Oh, if you were always with us, Papa, I think I might grow good at last, but I need your help so much, and you are gone more than half the time. Your heavenly father is never gone, daughter, and will never turn a deaf ear to a cry for strength to resist the temptation to sin. He says, In me is thine help. And we are told God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. In the meantime, Mrs. Dinsmore, who from choice took most of the housekeeping cares, was ordering an early dinner and various baskets of provisions for the picnic. As the family sat down to the table, these last were being conveyed on board a yacht lying at the little pier near the bathing house below the cliffs, and almost immediately upon finishing their meal, all, old and young, trooped down the stairways across the sandy beach and were themselves soon aboard the vessel. Others of the company were already seated in it, and the rest following a few minutes later, and the last basket of provisions being safely stowed away in some safe corner of the craft, they set sail dragging at their stern a dory, in which was a large quantity of clams in the shell. It was a bright day, and a favorable breeze set the yacht skimming over the water at an exhilarating rate of speed. All hearts seemed light, every face was bright, not excepting Lulu's, though she was attired in the plain colored dress recommended by Grandma Elsie. There was no greater display of finery than a knot of bright ribbon on the part of even the gayest young girl present. Betty wore a black bunting one of her school dresses, with a cardinal ribbon at the throat, Zoe the brown woolen, that had for her such mingled associations of pain and pleasure, and looked wonderfully sweet and pretty in it, Edward thought. They sat side by side, and Betty, watching them furtively, said to herself, They are, for all the world, just like a pair of lovers yet, though they have been married over a year. Then, turning her attention first to Violet and Captain Raymond, then upon her aunt and Uncle Dinsmore, she came to the same conclusion in regard to them also. And it was just so with Cousin Elsie and her husband, she mused. I can remember how devoted they were to each other. But she seems very happy now, 
and she well may be with the father, sons and daughters all so devoted to her. And she's so rich, too, never has to consider how to make one dollar do the work of two, a problem I am so often called upon to solve. In fact, it is to her an uncle, Bob and I owe our education, and pretty much everything we have. I don't envy her her money, but I do the love that has surrounded her all her life. She never knew her own mother, to be sure, but her father petted and fondled her as a child, and was father and mother both to her. I've often heard her say, Well, mine died before I was born, and mother lost her reason when I was a little thing. But Betty was not much given to melancholy musing, or indeed to musing of any kind. A passing sail presently attracted her attention, and turned her thoughts into a new channel. And soon, the wind and tide being favorable, the yacht drew near her destination. There was no wharf, but the passengers were taken to the shore, a few at a time in the dory. It also landed provision baskets and the clams. Those ladies and gentlemen, to whom clam bakes were a new experience, watched with interest the process of cooking the bivalves. A pit of suitable size for the quantity to be prepared was made in the sand, the bottom covered with stones. It was then heated by a fire kindled in it. The brands were removed, seaweed spread over the stones, the clams poured in, abundance of seaweed piled over and about them, a piece of an old sail put over that, and they were left to bake or steam, while another fire was kindled nearby, and a large tin bucket, filled with water, set on it to boil for making coffee. While some busied themselves with these culinary operations, others repaired to the dwelling, which stood some little distance back from the beach, the ground sloping gently away from it to the water's edge. The lady of the house met them at the door, and hospitably invited them to come in and rest themselves in her parlor, or sit on the porch, and understanding their errand to the locality, not only gave ready permission for their table to be spread in the shade of her house, but offered to lend anything they might require in the way of utensils. Accepting her offer, they set to work, the men making a rough sort of impromptu table with some boards, and the ladies spreading upon it the contents of the provision baskets. Mrs. Dinsmore, Elsie, and the younger ladies of their party offered to assist in these labors, but were told that they were considered guests and must be content to look on or wander about and amuse themselves. There was not much to be seen but grassy slopes destitute of tree or shrub and the harbor and open sea beyond. They seated themselves upon the porch of the dwelling house while Captain Raymond and the younger members of the family party wandered here and there about the place. There seemed to be some sport going on among the cooks, those engaged in preparing the coffee. Lulu hurried toward them to see what it was about, then came running back to her father, who stood a little farther up the slope with Grace clinging to his hand. Oh, she said with a face of disgust, I don't mean to drink any of that coffee. Why would you believe it? They stirred it with a poker. Did they? laughed the captain. They might have done worse. I presume that was used for lack of a long enough spoon. We must not be too particular on such occasions as this. But you won't drink any of it, will you, Papa? I think it altogether likely I shall. Why, Papa, coffee that was stirred with a dirty poker? We will just suppose the poker was not very dirty, he said, with a good-humored smile. Probably there was nothing worth on it than a little ashes, which, diffused through so large a quantity of liquid, could harm no one. Must I drink it if they offer me a cup? No, there need be no compulsion about it. Indeed, I think it better for a child of your age not to take coffee at all. But you never said I shouldn't, Papa. No, because you had formed the habit in my absence, and as I am not sure that it is a positive injury to you, I felt loath to deprive you of the pleasure. You are so kind, Papa, she said, slipping her hand into his and looking up affectionately into his face. But I will give up coffee if you want me to. I like it, but I can do without it. I think milk is far more wholesome for you, he said with a smile of pleased approval. I should like you to make it your ordinary beverage at meals, but I do not forbid an occasional cup of coffee. Thank you, Papa, she returned. Grandma Elsie once told me that when she was a little girl, her father wouldn't allow her to drink coffee at all or to eat any kind of hot cakes or sweet rich cake, and oh, I don't know how many things that she liked he wouldn't let her have. I don't think he was half as nice a father as ours, do you, Gracie? Of course I don't, Lou. I just think we've got the very best in the whole world, responded Grace, laying her cheek affectionately against the hand that held hers in its strong, loving clasp. That is only because he is your own, my darlings, 
the captain said, smiling down tenderly upon them. A lady had drawn near and now said, Supper is ready, Captain Raymond. Will you bring your little girls and come to the table? Thank you. We will do so with pleasure, he said, following her as she led the way. The table, covered with a snow-white cloth and heaped with tempting viands, presented a very attractive appearance. The clams were brought on after most of the company were seated, with their coffee and bread and butter before them. They were served hot from the fire, and the shell in neat paper trays, and eaten with melted butter. Eaten thus, they make a dish fit for a king. By the time that all appetites were satisfied, the sun was near its setting, and it was thought best to return without delay. On repairing to the beach, they found the tide so low that even the dory could not come close to dry land, so the ladies and children were carried through the water to the yacht. This gave occasion for some merriment. "'You must carry me, Ned, if I've got to be carried,' said Zoe. "'I'm not going to let anybody else do it.' "'No, nor am I,' he returned gaily, picking her up and striding forward. "'I claim it as my special privilege.' Mr. Dinsmore followed with his wife, then Captain Raymond with his. "'Get in, Mr. Dinsmore,' said the captain, as they deposited their burdens. "'There is no occasion for further exertion on your part. I'll bring mother.' "'No, sir,' said Edward, hurrying shoreward again. "'That's my task. You have your children to take care of.' "'Your mother's my child, Ned, and I think I shall take care of her,' Mr. Dinsmore said, hastening back to the little crowd still at the water's edge. "'We will have to let her decide which of us shall have the honor,' said the captain. "'That I won't,' Mr. Dinsmore said laughingly, stepping to his daughter's side and taking her in his arms. "'Now you two may take care of the younger ones,' he added with a triumphant glance at his two rivals. "'Ah, Ned, we are completely outwitted,' laughed the captain." "'Yes, with Grandpa about, one can't get half a chance to wait upon Mother. "'Betty, shall I have the honor and pleasure of conveying you aboard of yonder vessel?' "'Yes, thank you. I see Harold and Herbert are taking Rosie and Walter,' she said. "'But I warn you that I am a good deal heavier than Zoe.' "'Nevertheless, I think my strength will prove equal to the exertion,' he returned, "'as he lifted her from the ground. "'Lulu and Grace stood together, hand in hand, Max on Gracie's other side. "'Take Gracie first, please, Papa,' said Lulu. "'She is frightened, I believe.' "'Frightened?' he said, stooping to take her in his arms. "'There is nothing to be afraid of, darling. "'Do you think Papa would leave you behind or drop you into the water?' "'No, I know you wouldn't,' she said with a little nervous laugh "'and clinging tightly about his neck. "'Mayn't I wait out, Papa?' Max called after him. "'Yes, but stay with your sister till I come for her.' "'Where's my baby, Levis? asked Violet laughingly, "'as he set Grace down by her side. "'A baby! Sure enough, where is it?' he exclaimed with an anxious glance toward the shore. "'Ah, there stands the nurse, with it in her arms. You shall have it in yours in a moment.' "'Here's the baby, Papa. Please take her first. I don't mind waiting,' said Lulu, as he stepped ashore again. He gave her a pleased, approving look. "'That is right. It will be but a minute or two, he said, as he took the babe and turned away with it. In a few moments more all passengers were aboard, and they set sail. But they had not gone far when it became evident that something was amiss. They were making no progress. "'What is the matter?' asked several voices, and Violet looked inquiringly at her husband. "'There is no cause for apprehension,' he said. "'We are aground, and may possibly have to wait here for the turn of the tide. That's all.' "'It's the lowest tide I ever saw,' remarked the captain of the yacht. "'We'll have to lighten her. If some of the heaviest of you will get into the dory, it will help.' Quite a number immediately volunteered to do so. Among them, Edward and Zoe, Bob and Betty, Harold and Herbert. The dory was speedily filled, and then, with a little more exertion, the yacht was set afloat. They moved out into deep water, and a gentle breeze wafted them pleasantly toward their desired haven. "'Look at the sun, Papa,' Elsie said, gazing westward. "'It has a peculiar appearance.' "'Yes,' he said. "'It looks a good deal like a balloon. Its redness obscured by that leaden-colored cloud. It is very near its setting. We shall not get in till after dark.' But that will not matter. Oh, no, our captain is so thoroughly acquainted with his vessel, the harbor and the wharf, that I have no doubt he would land us safely, even were it much darker than it will be. Zoe and Edward in the dory were talking to the Nantucket lady, a Mrs. Fry. How do you like our island, and particularly our town? she asked. Oh, ever so much, said Zoe. We have visited a good many watering places and seaside resorts, but never one where there was so much to see and to do. So many delightful ways of passing the time. I think I shall vote for Nantucket again next year, 
when we are considering where to pass the hot months. And I, said Edward, echo my wife's sentiments on the subject under discussion. Your wife! the lady exclaimed with a look of surprise. I took her to be your sister. You are both so very young in appearance. We are not very old, laughed Edward. Zoe is but sixteen, but we have been married a year. You have begun early. It is thought by some that early marriages are apt to be the happiest, and I should think them likely to be, provided the two of you are willing to conform your tastes and habits each to those of the other. I trust you two have a long life of happiness before you. Thank you, they both said, Edward adding, I think we are disposed to accommodate ourselves to each other, and whether our lives be long or short, our trials many or few, I trust we shall always find great happiness in mutual sympathy, love, and confidence. The lady asked if they had seen all the places of interest on the island, and in reply they named those they had seen. Have you been to Mrs. Max? she asked. No, madam, we have not so much as heard of her existence, returned Edward sportively. May I ask who and what she is? Yes, she is the widow of a sea captain, who has a collection of curiosities which he keeps on exhibition, devoting the proceeds, so she says, to benevolent purposes. She is an odd body, herself the greatest curiosity she has to show. I think you should visit her museum by all means. We shall be happy to do so if you will kindly put us in the way of it, said Edward. How shall we proceed in order to gain admittance? If we can get up a party, it will be easy enough. I shall then send her word, and she will appoint the hour when she will receive us. She likes to show her independence, and will not exhibit unless to a goodly number. I know several visitors on the island who want to go, and if your party will join with them, there will be no difficulty. I think I can promise that we will, said Edward. I will let you know positively tomorrow morning. That will do nicely. Hark, they are singing aboard the yacht. They listened in silence till the song was finished. I recognized most of the voices, Mrs. Fry remarked, but two lovely sopranos were quite new to me. Do you know the owners? Turning smilingly to Edward. My mother and sister, he answered with proud satisfaction. Naturally fine and very highly cultivated, she said. You must be proud of them. I am, Edward admitted with a happy laugh. The sun was down and twilight had fairly begun. Grace, seated on her father's knee, was gazing out over the harbor. See, Papa! How many little lights down close to the water, she said. Yes, they are lamps on the small boats that are sailing or rowing about. They show them for safety from running into each other. And they look so pretty. Yes, so they do, and it is a sight one may have every evening from the wharf. Shall I take you down there some evening and let you sit and watch them as they come and go? Oh, yes, do, Papa. I think it would be so nice. And you would take Max and Lulu, too, wouldn't you? If they should happen to want to go... There are benches on the wharf where we can sit and have a good view. I think we will try it tomorrow evening, if nothing happens to prevent. Oh, I'm so glad. You are such a good, kind papa, she said, delightedly giving him a hug. The very best you have ever had, I suppose, he responded with a pleased laugh. Yes, indeed, she answered, naively, quite missing the point of his jest. On reaching home, Edward and Zoe reported their conversation with the lady in the dory, and asked, Shall we not go? I think so, by all means, since it is for benevolent objects, said Elsie. Or anyhow, since we feel in duty bound to see all that is to be seen on this island, said Captain Raymond. No dissenting voice was raised, and when the next morning word came that Mrs. Mack would exhibit that afternoon, if a party were made up to attend, they all agreed to go. The distance was too great for ladies and children to walk, so carriages were ordered. Captain Raymond and his family filled one. This is the street that the oldest house is on, remarked Lulu as they turned a corner. I mean that one we went to see, that has a big horseshoe on its chimney. What do they have that for, Papa? asked Grace. In old times, when many people were ignorant and superstitious, it was thought to be a protection from witches. Witches, Papa? What are they? I don't think there are any, really, he said with a kindly smile, into the eagerly inquiring little face. But in old times it was a very common belief that there were people, generally some withered-up old women, who had dealings with Satan and were given power by him to torment or bring losses and various calamities upon any one whom they disliked. When you are a little older you shall hear more about it, and how that foolish belief led to great crimes and cruelties inflicted upon many innocent, harmless people. But now, while my Gracie is so young and timid, I do not want her to know much about such horrors. "'Yes, Papa,' she responded. 
I won't try to know till you think I'm quite old enough. Several vehicles drew up at the same moment in front of Mrs. Mack's door, and greetings and some introductions were exchanged on the sidewalk and doorsteps. Edward introduced his mother and Mrs. Fry to each other, and the latter presented to them a Mrs. Glenn, who, she said, was a native of Nantucket, but had only recently returned after an absence of many years. Mrs. Mack knew me as a young girl, remarked, Mrs. Glenn remarked, and I am quite curious to see whether she will recognize me. At that instant, the door was opened in answer to their ring, and they were invited to enter and walk into the parlor. They found it comfortably furnished and neat as wax. Seating themselves, they waited patiently for some moments for the coming of the lady of the house. At length, she made her appearance, a little old lady, neatly attired and with a pleasant countenance. Mrs. Fry saluted her with a good afternoon, adding, I have brought some friends with me to look at your curiosities. This lady, indicating Mrs. Glenn, you ought to know as you were acquainted with her in her girlhood. Do you know me, Mrs. Mack? asked Mrs. Glenn, offering her hand. Yes, you look as natural as the pigs, was the rather startling reply, accompanied, however, by a smile and a cordial shake of the offered hand. Now we'll take the money first to make sure of it, was the next remark, addressed to the company in general. What is your admission fee? asked Mr. Dinsmore, producing his pocket book. Fifteen cents apiece. By no means exorbitant, if your collection is worth seeing, he returned good-humoredly. Never mind your purses, Elsie, Raymond, Ned. I'll act as paying master for the party. The all-important business of collecting the entrance fees having been duly attended to, Mrs. Mack led the way to an upper room where minerals, shells, shark's teeth, and various other curiosities and relics were spread out upon tables and shelves, ranged along the sides and in the center of the apartment. Now, she said, the first thing is to register your names. You must all register. You begin, handing the book to Mr. Dinsmore. You seem to be the oldest. I presume I am, he said dryly, taking the book and doing as he was bidden. Now you, Raymond, passing it on to the captain, will take it for granted that you are next in age and importance. That's right, Captain, laughed Betty, as he silently took the book and wrote his name. It wouldn't be at all polite to seem to think yourself younger than any lady present. Of course not, Miss Betty. Will you take your turn next? Of course not, sir. Do you mean to insinuate that I am older than Aunt Rose? She asked, passing the book on to Mrs. Dinsmore. Don't be too particular about going according to ages, said Mrs. Mack. It takes up too much time. You may write my name for me, Ned, said Zoe when he took the book. Yes, write your sister's name for her. It'll do just as well, said Mrs. Mack. But I'm not his sister, said Zoe. What then, is he your lover? No, Edward said, laughing. We're husband and wife. You have begun young, she remarked, taking the book and passing it on. Don't look as if you'd cut your wisdom teeth yet, either of you. When the ladies have all registered, some of you grown folks had better do it for the children. Having seen all their names duly inscribed in her register, seat yourselves, she said, waving her hand towards some benches and chairs. Then, with the help of a half-grown girl, she set on a small circular table, placed a box upon it, pushed up chairs and a bench or two, and said, Now as many of you as can, come and sit round this table. The others shall have their turn afterward. When all the places were filled, she opened the box and took from it a number of beautifully carved articles, napkin rings, spoons, etc. Now all take your turns in looking at this lovely carved work while I tell you its story, she said, the story of how it came into my possession. You see, my husband was a sea captain, and upon one occasion, when he was about setting sail for a long voyage, a young man, a lad, he was hardly old enough to be called a man, came and asked to be taken as one of the crew. He gave a name, but it wasn't his true name, inherited from his father, as my husband afterward discovered. But not suspecting anything wrong, he engaged the lad and took him with him, and the lad behaved well aboard the ship, and he used to carve wonderfully well, as you may see by looking at these articles just with a jackknife, and finally, keeping at it in his leisure moments, he made all these articles, carving them out of shark's teeth. You can see he must have had genius, hadn't he? And yet he'd run away from home to go to sea, as my husband afterward had good reason to believe. She made a long story of it, spinning out her yarn until the first set had examined the carved work to their satisfaction. Then, reverse yourselves, she said, indicating by a wave of her hand that they were to give place at the table to the rest of the company. When all had had an opportunity to examine the specimens of the lad's skill, the young girl was ordered to restore them to the box, but first to count them. That last clause brought an amused smile to nearly every face in the audience. But Lulu frowned and muttered, 
just as if she thought we would steal them. Next, Mrs. Mack began the circuit of the room, carrying a long slender stick with which she pointed out those which she considered the most interesting of her specimens or articles of virtue. One of these last was a very large, very old-fashioned back comb, having a story with a moral attached, the latter recited in doggerel rhyme. She had other stories in connection with other articles to tell in the same way. In fact, so many and so long were they that the listeners grew weary and inattentive ere the exhibition was brought to a close. The afternoon was waning when they left the house. As Captain Raymond and his family drove into the heart of the town on their way home, their attention was attracted by the loud ringing of a handbell, followed now and again by noisy vociferation in a discordant man's voice. "'So the evening boat is in,' remarked the captain. "'How do you know, Papa?' asked Grace. "'By hearing the town crier call his papers, which could not have come in any other way.' "'What does he say, Papa?' queried Lulu. "'I have listened as intently as possible many a time, but I never can make out more than a word or two, sometimes not that.' "'No more can I,' he answered with a smile. "'It sounds to me like the first news is um-mum, "'and the second news is mum-um-mum, "'and the third news is um-um-mum.' "'The children all laughed. "'Yonder he is, coming this way,' said Max, "'leaning from the carriage window. "'Beckon to him,' said the captain. "'I want a paper.' "'Max obeyed. The carriage stopped. "'The crier drew near and handed up the paper asked for. "'How much?' inquired the captain. Five cents, sir. "'Why, how was that?' You asked me but three for yesterday's edition of this same paper. More news than this one. Ah, you charge according to the amount of news, do you? Returned the captain, laughing and handing him a nickel. Yes, sir, I guess that's about the fair way, said the crier, hastily regaining the sidewalk to renew the clang-clang of his bell and the um-mum-mum of his announcement. End of chapter 11. Recording by Amy. Chapter 12 of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy. Chapter 12. Wave high your torches on each crag and cliff. Let many lights blaze on our battlements. Shout to them in the pauses of the storm, and tell them there is hope. Maturing's Bertram. The evening was cool, and our whole party were gathered in the parlor of the cottage, occupied by the Dinsmores and Travelers. Games, fancy work, reading, and conversation, making the time fly. Edward and Zoe had drawn a little apart from the others, and were conversing together in an undertone. "'Suppose we go out and promenade the veranda for a while,' he said presently. "'I will get you a wrap and that knit affair for your head that I think is so pretty and becoming.' "'Crocheted,' she corrected. "'Yes, I'm quite in the mood for a promenade with my husband, and I'm sure the air outside must be delightful.' "'but you won't have to go farther than that stand in the corner for my things.' "'He brought them, wrapped the shawl carefully about her, and they went out. "'Betty, looking after them, remarked aside to her cousin Elsie, "'How lover-like they are still!' "'Yes,' Elsie said with a glad smile. "'They are very fond of each other, and it rejoices my heart to see it.' "'And one might say exactly the same of the captain and Violet,' pursued Betty in a lower tone. And glancing toward that couple as they sat side by side on the opposite sofa, Violet with her babe in her arms, the captain clucking and whistling to it, while it cooed and laughed in his face, Violet's ever-beautiful face, more beautiful than its wont, with its expression of exceeding love and happiness, as her glance rested now upon her husband and now upon her child. Yes, Elsie said again, watching them with a joyous smile, still wreathing her lips and shining in her eyes. "'and it is just so with my dear Elsie and Lester. "'I am truly blessed in seeing my children so well mated "'and so truly happy.' "'Zoe, little wife,' Edward was saying, out on the veranda, "'can you spare me for a day or two? "'Spare you, Ned? How do you mean? "'I should like to join the boys, Bob, Harold, and Herbert, "'in a little trip on a sailing vessel "'which leaves here early tomorrow morning, "'and will return in the evening of the next day, "'or the next but one. "'I should ask my little wife to go with us, but unfortunately the vessel has no accommodations for ladies. What do you say, love? I shall not go without your consent. Thank you, you dear boy, for saying that, she responded affectionately, squeezing the arm on which she leaned. Go if you want to. I know I can't help missing the kindest and dearest husband in the world, but I shall try to be happy in looking forward to the joy of reunion on your return. That's a dear, he said, bending down to kiss the ruby lips. It is a great delight to meet after a short separation. 
and we should miss that entirely if we never parted at all. But, oh, Ned, if anything should happen to you, she said in a quivering voice. Hush, hush, love, he answered soothingly. Don't borrow trouble. Remember, we are under the same protection on the sea as on the land, and perhaps as safe on one as on the other. Yes, but when I am with you, I share your danger, if there is any, and that is what I wish, for, oh, Ned, I couldn't live without you. I hope you may never have to try it, my darling, he said in tender tones, or I be called to endure the trial of having to live without you. Yet we can hardly hope to go together. But let us not vex ourselves with useless fears. We have the promise, as thy days, so shall thy strength be. And we know that nothing can befall us without the will of our Heavenly Father, whose love and compassion are infinite. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. But if one is not at all sure of belonging to him, she said in a voice so low that he barely caught the words, then the way is open to come to him. He says, Come unto me, him that cometh unto me, I will no wise cast out. The invitation is to you, love as truly as if addressed to you alone, as truly as if you could see his kind eyes looking directly at you and hear his voice speaking the sweet words. It is my ardent wish, my most earnest, constant prayer, that my beloved wife may speedily learn to know, love, and trust in him, who is the way, the truth, and the life. You are so good, Ned. I wish I were worthy of such a husband, she murmured, half sighing as she spoke. Quite a mistake, Zoe, he replied with unaffected humility. To hear you talk so makes me feel like a hypocrite. I have no righteousness of my own to plead, but, thanks be unto God, I may rejoice in the imputed righteousness of Christ. And that may be yours too, love, for the asking. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. They are the Master's own words, and he adds, For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Meanwhile, the contemplated trip of the young men was under discussion in the parlor. "'Dear me,' said Betty, who had just heard of it, "'how much fun men and boys do have. "'Don't you wish you were one of them, Lulu?' "'No, I don't,' returned Lulu promptly. "'I'd like to be allowed to do some of the things they do that we mustn't, "'but I don't want to be a boy.' "'That is right,' said her father. "'There are few things so unpleasant to me as a masculine woman "'who wishes herself a man and tries to ape the stronger, coarser sex.' in dress and manners. I hope my girls will always be content, and more than content, to be what God has made them. If you meant to hit me that time, Captain, remarked Betty in a lively tone, let me tell you it was a miserable failure, for I don't wish I was a man and never did. Coarse creatures, as you say, present company always excepted. Who would want to be one of them? I'd never have anything to do with one of them, if I were in your place, Bet, laughed her brother. Perhaps I shouldn't, only that they seem a sort of necessary evil she retorted but why didn't you invite some of us ladies to go along because you are not necessary evils returned her brother with a twinkle of fun in his eye you should one and all have an invitation if we could make you comfortable said harold gallantly but the vessel is absolutely no accommodation for ladies ah then you are excusable returned betty the young men left the next morning after an early breakfast zoe and betty drove down to the wharf with them to see them off and watched the departing vessel till she disappeared from sight. Zoe went home in tears, Betty doing her best to console her. Come now, be a brave little woman. It's only for two or three days at the farthest. Why, I'd never get married if I thought I shouldn't be able to live so long without the fortunate man I bestowed my hand upon. Oh, you don't know anything about it, Betty, sobbed Zoe. Ned's all I have in the world, and it's so lonesome without him. And then how do you know that he'll ever get back? A storm may come up, and the vessel be wrecked. That's just possible, said Betty, and it's great folly to make yourself miserable over bare possibilities, things which may never happen. Oh, you are a great deal too wise for me, said Zoe in disgust. Oh, cried Betty, if it's a pleasure and comfort to you to be miserable, to make yourself so by anticipating the worst, do so by all means. I have heard of people who are never happy but when they are miserable. But I am not one of that sort said Zoe in an aggrieved tone. I am as happy as a lark when Ned is with me. Yes, and I'll show you that I can be cheerful even without him. She accordingly wiped her eyes, put on the smile, and began talking in a sprightly way about the beauty of the sea as they looked upon it, with its waves dancing and sparkling in the brilliant light of the morning sun. What shall we do today? queried Betty. Take a drive, said Zoe. 
Yes, I wish there was some new route or new place to go to. There's a pretty drive to the South Shore that maybe you have not tried yet, suggested the hackman. South Shore? That's another name for Surfside, isn't it? asked Betty. It's another part of the same side of the island I refer to, he answered. It's a nice drive through the avenue of pines, a road the lovers are fond of, and if the south wind blows, as it does this morning, you have a fine surf to look at when you get there. If a drive is talked of today, let us propose this one, Zoe, said Betty. Yes, I dare say it is as pleasant as any we could take, assented Zoe. I wish Edward was here to go with us. Elsie, with her usual thoughtfulness for others, had been considering what could be done to prevent Zoe from feeling lonely in Edward's absence. She saw the hack drop at the door and meeting the young girls on the threshold with a bright face and pleasant smile. You've seen the boys off, she said, half inquiringly. The weather is so favorable that I think they can hardly fail to enjoy themselves greatly. Yes, Mamma, I hope they will. But ah, a storm may come up and wreck them before they can get back, sighed Zoe, furtively wiping away a tear. Possibly, but we won't be so foolish as to make ourselves unhappy by anticipating evils that may never come was the cheery rejoinder. The Edna has a skillful captain, a good crew, and is doubtless entirely seaworthy, at least so Edward assured me, and for the rest we must trust in Providence. Come in now and let me give you each a cup of coffee. Your breakfast with the boys was so early and so slight that you may find appetite for a supplement, she added sportively, as she led the way into the cozy little dining room of the cottage, where they found a tempting repast spread especially for them, the others having already taken their morning meal. "'How nice in you, Cousin Elsie!' exclaimed Betty. "'I wasn't expecting to eat another breakfast, "'but I find a rapidly coming appetite. "'These muffins and this coffee are so delicious.' "'So they are,' said Zoe. "'I never knew anybody else quite so kindly thoughtful as Mamma. "'I think I know several,' Elsie rejoined. "'But it is very pleasant to be so highly appreciated. "'Now, my dear girls, you will confer a favor. "'If you will tell me in what way I can make the day pass most pleasantly to you.' "'Thank you, cousin. It is a delightful morning for a drive, I think,' said Betty, then went on to repeat what their hackman had said of the drive to the south shore. "'It sounds pleasant. I think we will make up a party and try it,' Elsie said. "'You would like it, Zoe?' "'Yes, Mamma. better than anything I know of beside. The man says that just there the beach has not been so thoroughly picked over for shells and other curiosities, and we may be able to find some worth having. No one had any special plans made for the day.' so all were ready to fall into this proposed by Zoe and Betty. Hacks were ordered, enough to hold all of their party now at hand, and they started. They found the drive all it had been represented. For some distance their way lay along the bank of a long pond, pretty to look at and interesting, as connected with old times and ways of life on the island. Their hackmen told them that formerly large flocks of sheep were raised by the inhabitants, and this pond was one of the places where the sheep were brought at a certain time of year, to be washed and shorn. On arriving at their destination, they found a long stretch of sandy beach, with great thundering waves dashing upon it. Oh! cried Zoe and Betty in delight. It is like a bit of sconset. Look away yonder, said Lulu. Isn't that a fisherman's cart? Yes, replied her father. Suppose we go near and see what he is doing. Oh, yes, do let us, Papa, cried Lulu, always ready to go everywhere and see everything. "'You may run on with Max and Gracie,' he said. "'Some of us will follow presently.' He turned and offered his arm to Violet. "'It is heavy walking in this deep sand. Let me help you.' "'Thank you. It is wearisome, and I am glad to have my husband's strong arm to lean upon,' she answered, smiling sweetly up into his eyes as she accepted the offered aid. The young girls and the children came running back to meet them. "'He's catching bluefish,' they announced. "'He has a good many in his cart.' "'Now watch him, Mamma Vi. "'You haven't had a chance to see such fishing before,' said Max. "'See, he's whirling his trail. "'There, now he has it sent far out into the water. "'Now he's hauling it in, and, oh yes, a good big fish with it.' "'What is a trail?' Violet asked. "'It is a hook with a long piece of lead above it, "'covered with eel skin,' answered her husband. "'There it goes again,' she exclaimed. "'It is a really interesting sight, but rather hard work, I should think.' When tired of watching the fishermen, they wandered back and forth along the beach in search of curiosities, picking up bits of sponge, rockweed, seaweed, and a greater variety of shells than they had been able to find on other parts of the shore which they had visited. 
It was only when they had barely time enough left to reach home for a late dinner that they were all willing to enter the carriages and be driven away from the spot. As they passed through the streets of the town, the crier was out with his handbell. Oh, yes, oh, yes, all the windows to be taken out of the Athenaeum today, and the Athenaeum to be elevated tonight. After listening intently to several repetitions of the cry, they succeeded in making it out. But what on earth does he mean? exclaimed Betty. Ventilated, I presume, replied the captain. There was an exhibition there last night, and complaints were made that the room was close. Toward evening of the next day, our friends in the cliff cottages began to look for the return of the Edna with the four young men of their party. But night fell, and yet they had not arrived. Elsie began to feel anxious, but tried not to allow her disturbance to be perceived, especially by Zoe, who seemed restless and ill at ease, going often out to the edge of the cliff, and gazing long and intently toward that quarter of the horizon, where she had seen the Edna disappear on the morning she sailed out of Nantucket Harbor. She sought her post of observation for the twentieth time just before sunset, and remained there till it grew too dark to see much beyond the line of breakers along the shore below. Turning to re-enter the house, she found Captain Raymond standing by her side. "'Oh, Captain!' she cried. "'Isn't it time the Edna was in?' "'I rather suppose they would be in a little earlier than this, but I'm not at all surprised that they are not,' he answered in a cheery tone. "'Indeed, it is quite possible that they may not get in till tomorrow. When they left, it was uncertain that they would come back today. So, my good sister, I think we have no cause for anxiety. Then I shall try not to be anxious, she said. But it seems like a month since I parted from Ned, and it's a sore disappointment not to see him tonight. I don't know how Vi stands your long absences, Captain. Don't you suppose it's about as hard for me as for her, considering how charming she is? He asked lightly. Perhaps it is, but men don't live in their affections as women do. Love is only half the world to most loving of them, I verily believe, while it's all the world to us. There is some truth in that, he acknowledged. We men are compelled to give much time and thought to business, yet many of us are ardent lovers or affectionate husbands. I, for one, am extremely fond of wife and children. Yes, I am sure of it, and quite as sure that Ned is very fond of me. There isn't a doubt of it. I think I have never seen a happier couple than you seem to be, or than Leland and his Elsie. Yet Violet and I will not yield the palm to either of you. And was there ever such a mother-in-law's mamma? said Zoe. I don't bel believe I remember my own mother very distinctly, but I do not believe I could have loved her much better than I do Edward's mother. Words would fail me in an attempt to describe all her excellences, he responded. Well, Lulu, what is it? as a child came running toward them. Tea is ready, Papa, and Grandma Rose says, please come to it. Shortly after leaving the table, the captain, noticing that Zoe seemed anxious and sad, offered to go into the town and inquire if anything had been seen or heard of the Edna. "'Oh, thank you,' she said, brightening. "'But won't you take me along?' "'Certainly, if you think you will not find the walk too long and fatiguing.' "'Not a bit,' she returned, hastily donning a hat and shawl. "'Have you any objection to my company, Levis? Violet asked, with sportive look and tone. "'My love, I shall be delighted, if you feel equal to the exertion,' he answered with a look of pleasure that said more than the words. Quite, she said. Max, I know you like to wait on me. Will you please bring me my hat and shawl from the bedroom there? Yes, indeed, with pleasure, Mamma Vi, the boy answered with alacrity as he hastened to obey. Three won't make as agreeable a number for traveling the sidewalks as four. And I ought to be out looking for Bob, remarked Betty. So if anybody will ask me to go along, perhaps I may consent. Yes, do come, said Zoe. I'll take you for my escort, and we will walk decorously behind the captain and by, feeling no fear because under the protection of his wing, added the lively Betty. But do you think, sir, you have the strength and ability to protect three helpless females? she asked, suddenly wheeling round upon him. I have not a doubt I can render them all the aid and protection they are at all likely to need in this peaceful, law-abiding community, he answered with becoming gravity, as he gave his arm to his wife and led the way from the house. It is a rather lonely, but by no means dangerous walk, Cousin Betty, he added, holding the gate open for her and the others to pass out. Lonely enough for me to indulge in a moderate amount of fun and laughter. Is it not, sir? she returned in an inquiring tone. She seemed full of life and gaiety, while Zoe was unusually quiet. They walked into the town and all the way down to the wharf, but the Edna was not there, nor could they hear any news of her. Zoe seemed full of anxiety and distress, 
though the others tried to convince her there was no occasion for it come come cheer up little woman the captain said seeing her eyes fill with tears if we do not see or hear from them by this time tomorrow night we may begin to be anxious but till then there is really no need there zoe you have an opinion that is worth something the captain being an experienced sailor remarked betty so try to be easy my dear and if you can't be easy be as easy as you can zoe laughed faintly at betty's jest then with a heroic effort put on an air of cheerfulness and contributed her full quota to the sprightly chat on the homeward walk she kept up her cheerful manner till she had parted from the rest for the night but wet her solitary pillow with tears ere her anxiety and loneliness were forgotten in sleep her spirits revived with the new day for the sun rose clear and bright the sea was warm and calm and she said to herself oh surely the edna will come in before night and ned and i will be together again many times that day both she and his mother scanned intently the wide waste of waters and watched with eager eyes the approach of some distant sail hoping it might prove the one they looked and longed for but their hopes were disappointed again and again noon passed and the edna was not in sight mamma what can be keeping them sighed zoe as the two stood together on the brow of the hill still engaged in their fruitless search not necessarily anything amiss elsie answered you remember that when they went it was quite uncertain whether they would return earlier than to-night so let us not suffer ourselves to be uneasy because they are not yet here i am ashamed of myself zoe said i wish i could learn to be as patient and cheerful as you are mamma i trust you will be more so by the time you are my age elsie said putting an arm about zoe's waist and drawing her close with a tender caress i still at times feel the risings of impatience i have not fully learned to let patience have her perfect work there is an old proverb a watched pot never boils she added with sportive look and tone suppose we seat ourselves in the veranda yonder and try to forget the edna for a while in an interesting story i have a new book which looks very interesting and has been highly commended in some of the reviews we will get papa to read it aloud to us while we busy ourselves with our fancy work shall we not zoe assented though with rather an indifferent air and they returned to the house mr and mrs dinsmore the only ones they found there the others being all down on the beach fell readily into the plan the book and the work were brought out and the reading began it was a good well-told story and even zoe presently became thoroughly interested down on the beach violet and the captain sat together in the sand he searching sea and sky with a spyglass she noticed a look of anxiety creeping over his face what is it levis she asked i fear there's a heavy storm coming he said i wish with all my heart the edna was in but i trust they have been wise enough not to put out to sea and are safe in harbor somewhere i hope so indeed she responded fervently for we have much precious freight aboard of her but the sky does not look very threatening to me levis does it not i wish i could say the same but little wife are you weatherwise or otherwise he asked laughingly not wise in any way except as i may lay claim to the wisdom of my other half she returned adopting his sportive tone ah she exclaimed the next moment i too begin to see some indications of a storm it is growing very dark yonder in the northeast betty came hurrying up panting and frightened oh captain be a dear good man and say you don't think we are to have a storm directly before bob and the rest get safe to shore i should be glad to oblige you betty he said but i cannot say that and what would it avail if i did could my opinion stay the storm zoe will be frightened to death about edward she said turning her face seaward again as she spoke and gazing with tear-dimmed eyes at the black threatening cloud fast spreading from horizon to venus and i oh bob is nearer to me than any other creature on earth let us hope for the best betty the captain said kindly it is quite possible perhaps i might say probable that the edna is now lying at anchor in some safe harbor and will stay there till the storm is over oh thank you for telling me that she cried i'll just try to believe it is so and not fret though it would pretty nearly kill me if anything should happen to bob still it will do no good to fret prayer would do far more said violet softly prayer to him whom even the winds and the sea obey but isn't it time to go in leave us the storm seems to be coming up so very fast yes he said rising and helping her get to her feet where are the children yonder said betty nodding in their direction i'll tell them shall i no thank you you and violet hurry on to the house 
as fast as you can. I will call the children, follow with them, and probably overtake you in time to help you up the stairs. Before they were all safely housed, the wind had come down upon them and was blowing almost a gale. It was with considerable difficulty the captain succeeded in getting them all up the long, steep flights of stairs by which they must reach the top of the cliff. About the time they started for the house, the party in the veranda became aware that a storm was rising. Zoe saw it first and dropped her work in her lap with a cry. Oh, I knew it would be so. I just knew it. A dreadful storm is coming, and the Edna will be wrecked, and Edward will drown. I shall never see him again. The others were too much startled and alarmed at the moment to notice her wild words or make any reply. They all rose and hurried into the house, and Mr. Dinsmore began closing windows and doors. The children, Papa, cried Elsie. They must be down on the beach, and... The captain is with them, and I will go to their assistance, he replied, before she could finish her sentence. He rushed out as he spoke, to return the next moment with Walter in his arms, and the rest closely following. These are all safe, and for the others I must trust the Lord, Elsie said softly to herself, as her father set Walter down, and she drew the child to her side. But her cheek was very pale, and her lips trembled as she pressed them to the little fellow's forehead. He looked up wonderingly. Mamma, what is the matter? You're not afraid of wind and thunder? No, dear, but I fear for your brothers out on this stormy sea, she whispered in his ear. Pray for them, darling, that if God will, they may reach home in safety. Yes, Mamma, I will, and I believe he'll bring them. Is it because Ned's on the ship, so he's crying so? Yes, I must try to comfort her. And putting him gently aside, Elsie went to her young daughter-in-law, who had thrown herself upon a couch, and with her head pillowed on its arm, her face hidden in her hands, was weeping and sobbing as if her heart would break. Zoe, love, Elsie said, kneeling at her side and putting her about her. Do not despair. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. No, but he does let people drown, and oh, I can never live without my husband. Dear child, there is no need to consider that question till it is forced upon you. Try, dear one, to let that alone and rest in the promise. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. The captain had drawn near and was standing close beside them. Mother has given you the best of advice, my little sister, he said in his kind, cheery way. And for your further comfort, let me say that it is altogether likely the Edna is safe in harbor somewhere. I think they probably perceived the approach of the storm in season to be warned not to put out to sea till it should be over. Do you really think so, Captain? she asked, lifting her head to wipe away her tears. He assured her that he did, and thinking him a competent judge of what seamen would be likely to do in such an emergency, she grew calm for a time, though her face was still sad, and till darkness shut out the sight, she cast many an anxious glance from the window upon the raging waters. "'If not in harbor, they must be in great peril,' Mr. Dinsmore remarked, aside and half inquiringly to the captain. "'Yes, sir, yes, indeed. I am far more anxious than I should like to own to their mother, Zoe, or Violet.' It was near their tea hour when the storm burst. They gathered about the table as usual, but there was little eating done except by the children, and the meal was not enlivened, as was customary with them, by cheerful, sprightly chat, though efforts in that direction were not wanting on the part of several of their number. The storm raged on with unabated fury, and Zoe, as she listened to the howling of the wind and the deafening thunder peals, grew wild with terror for her husband. She could not be persuaded to go to bed, even when her accustomed hour for retiring was long past, but would sit in her chair moaning, Oh, Ned, Ned, my husband, my dear, dear husband, oh, if I could only do anything to help you. My darling, my darling, you are all I have, and I can't live without you. Then spring up and pace the floor, sobbing, wringing her hands, and sometimes, as a fierce blast shook the cottage, or a more deafening thunder peal crashed overhead, even shrieking out in terror and distress. In vain, Elsie tried to soothe and quiet her, with reassuring, comforting words or caresses and endearments. Oh, I can't bear it, she cried again and again. Ned is all I have, and it will kill me to lose him. Nobody can know how I suffer at the very thought. My dear, Elsie said with a voice trembling with emotion, you forget that Edward is my dearly loved son, and that I have two others who are no less dear to their mother's heart on board that vessel. Forgive me, Mamma, Zoe sobbed, taking Elsie's hand and dropping tears and kisses upon it. I did forget, and it was very shameful, for you are so kind and loving to me, putting aside your own grief and anxiety to help me in bearing mine. But how is it you can be so calm? Because, dear, I am enabled to stay my heart on God, my almighty friend, my kind, wise, heavenly Father. Listen, love, to these sweet words. O Lord God of hosts, 
who is a strong lord like unto thee or to thy faithfulness round about thee thou rulest the warring of the sea when the waves thereof arrive thou stillest them they are beautiful said betty who sat near in a despondent attitude her elbow on her knee her cheek in her hand oh cousin elsie i would give all the world for your faith and to be able to find the comfort and support in bible promises and teachings that you do the outer door opened and mr dinsmore and captain raymond came in their waterproof coats dripping with rain they had been out on the edge of the cliff taking an observation though it was little they could see through the darkness but occasionally the lightning's lurid flash lit up the scene for a moment and afforded a glimpse of the storm-tossed deep be comforted ladies the captain said there are at least no signs of any vessel in distress if any such were near she would undoubtedly be firing signal guns so i think we may hope my conjecture that our boys are safe in harbor somewhere is correct and the storm is passing over said mr dinsmore the thunder and lightning have almost ceased but the wind has not fallen and that is what makes a great danger grandpa isn't it asked zoe oh hark what was that i heard a voice and step and rushing to the outer door as she spoke she threw it open and found herself in her husband's arms oh ned ned she cried in a transport of joy is it really you oh i thought i should never see you again you dear 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 boy she clung round his neck and he held her close with many a caress and endearing word drawing her a little to one side to let his brothers step past them and embrace a tender mother who wept for joy as she received them almost as if restored to her from the very gates of death there love i must let you go while i take off this dripping coat edward said at length releasing zoe how wet i have made you i fear your pretty dress is quite spoiled he added with a tender regretful smile that's nothing she answered with a gay laugh you only have to buy me another and you've plenty of money plenty to supply all the wants of my little wife i hope ah mother dear as he threw aside his wet overcoat and took her in his arms were you alarmed for the safety of your three sons yes indeed i was she said returning his kisses and i feel that i have great cause for thankfulness and that you are all brought back to me unharmed oh that men would praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men betty had started up on the entrance of her cousins glancing eagerly from one dripping figure to another then staggered back and leaned pale and trembling against the wall in the excitement no one had noticed her but now she exclaimed in tremulous accents and catching her breath bob my brother where is he oh betty harold answered turning hastily at the sound of her voice forgive her thoughtlessness in not explaining that at once bob went to a hotel he said we could bring the news of his safety in our own and it wasn't worth while for him to travel all the way up here through the storm no of course not i wouldn't have had him do so she returned with a sigh of relief her face resuming its wonted gaiety of expression but i'm mighty glad he's safe on terra firma but your story boys let us have it said mr dinsmore yes we have a story grandpa said edward with emphasis and excitement but harold should do it he could do it better than i no no harold said you are as good a storyteller as i there laughed herbert i believe i'll have to do it myself or with your extreme politeness to each other you'll keep the audience waiting all night the storm came suddenly upon us when we were about halfway home or maybe something more and it presently became evident that we were in imminent danger of wreck the captain soon concluded that our only chance was in letting the edna drive right before the wind, which would take us in exactly the direction we wished to pursue, but with rather startling celerity, and that was what he did. She flew over the water like a winged wild bird and into the harbor with immense velocity, safe enough, though, till we were all there, almost at the wharf, when we struck against another vessel anchored near, and actually cut her in two, spilling the crew into the water. "'Don't look so horrified, mother dear,' said Harold, as Herbert paused for breath. "'No one was drowned, no one even hurt.' barring the wetting and the fright as the irish say added edward but the latter was a real hurt said harold for the cry they sent up as they made the sudden involuntary plunge from their berth where they were probably asleep at the moment of collision into the cold deep water of the harbor was something terrible to hear enough to curdle one's blood added herbert and you are quite sure all were picked up asked elsie her sweet face full of pity for the unfortunate sufferers yes mother quite sure answered edward the captain of the craft said in my hearing that no one was missing and the captain of the other will probably have pretty heavy damages to pay remarked mr dinsmore i presume so said edward but even that would be far better than the loss of his vessel with all the lives of those on board money could not pay for those last elsie said 
low and tremulously, as she looked at her three tall sons, through a mist of unshed tears, and I will gladly help the Edna's captain to meet the damages incurred in his efforts to save them. Just like you, mother, Edward said, giving her a look of fond, proud affection. I entirely approve, and shall be ready to contribute my share, said her father, but it is very late, or rather early, long past midnight, and we should be getting to bed. But let us first unite in a prayer of thanksgiving to our God for all his mercies, especially this, and our dear boys are restored to us unharmed. They knelt, and led by him, all hearts united in a fervent outpouring of gratitude and praise to the giver of all good. End of chapter 12 Recording by Amy